All right, so the stage is set. We know what we got to do. If you're an entrepreneur, I want you to be thinking about what your role is in achieving this goal, what your role is in Tech for Good Global. If you are a corporation, I want you to be thinking about how this helps you deliver purpose, how this helps you connect all of the people in your organization with a purpose, with something that really matters to them. If you are an investor, I want you to think about how impact investing is going to change the game and how it's going to change the relationships that you're able to have with the people that fund your work. Every single one of us in this room has a role to play in this. And again, I don't live in this country. Not yet. <laughs> but I can tell you that I feel the same thing. I spend a lot of time in Silicon Valley. I spend a lot of time in Europe. You've got something here, and the world needs it. We need it because there is absolutely no reason that people should go hungry in this world today. We have the technology. We have the brains. We have the ability to solve these problems. We have the ability to solve the education problem. We know how to do this, and I believe that Israel has an incredible role to play in changing the game around these. So you've each got your call to action. You've each got something to be thinking about. Now we're going to stimulate your brains, your hearts, and your minds with some of the most challenging, exciting speakers and actors in this space right now. And to kick us off, it is my immense pleasure to introduce somebody who, who almost needs no introduction in this space. The, um, the godfather of impact investing himself, Sir Ronald Cohen. Thank you very, very much. Greetings to everyone. Great to be here uh, with you all. I'm wearing a tie for the ambassador. <laughs> when I kicked off in the venture capital business at the age of 26, a long time ago, nobody really understood how important entrepreneurship was going to be, let alone tech entrepreneurship. That was in 1972. It took us 10 years to raise our first venture capital fund in 1981. Our first fund was 10 million pounds. The last fund I raised when I left Apex in 2005 was 5 billion euros. We started in Israel in 93. I started in Israel, not because my partners at Apex were Jewish, most of them were not. I started in Israel partly because I believed that it was important for Israel. It has to be said. But partly because I felt that here in Israel were specific ingredients that made it very likely that Israel would be successful in tech. And in 1993, we raised a $40 million fund. It had to be guaranteed against loss by OPIC in order to raise the money. And we started to invest in tech. And now, 20 plus years later, Silicon Wadi takes its position alongside Silicon Valley as one of the few ecosystems in the world that has really managed to nurture the sort of tech innovation that can bring breakthroughs at scale to the world. Today, I feel the same way about the impact revolution as I did about the tech revolution in 93. And I have a sense of déjà vu. And I want to explain in just a few minutes why. The impact revolution will be as big, in my view, as the tech revolution has been. Why? Look around you. Governments across the world are spending trillions 
more than 10 trillion a year for the OECD governments on health and education. And yet, can we really say that health and education issues, even in the developed countries, are receding? No. <coughs> Philanthropists are spending $600 billion a year across the world on a whole variety of different social issues. Do we really have hope that philanthropists can manage to solve the problem? No. So how are we going to solve problems which don't just mean that people are suffering everywhere across the world in billions, but problems that threaten the cohesion of our societies, that bring curtains of fire to separate rich from poor, in cities and in countries and in, in regions. And it's for this reason, because of this realization has been seeping in over two or three decades now, thank you. It's this realization which has brought us to understand that the world has to change. Historically, in the 19th century and before, when we made business and investment decisions, we made them on the basis of just financial return. In the 20th century, we added risk to return. And now, in the 21st century, it's risk, return, and impact. We're now beginning to realize that capital flows in the system cannot just be dictated by risk and return. We have to worry about the negative consequences that we achieve through our decision making, and we have to worry about creating positive improvement in people's lives. Once again, it's the millennial generation that is going to lead us there. I seldom see a business plan now, and I still see business plans very regularly, that doesn't have impact in it. The millennial generation wants meaning. It doesn't just want to make money, because it realizes that there is no other way forward. And investors, you may all find it difficult to raise money for a while, but $70 trillion worth of assets have signed up to the United Nations principles of responsible investment that say that you cannot just invest on the basis of making money alone and that you have to take into consideration social and environmental consequences. So led by millennials and pushed by investors, we're going to get to a world where this evolution in thinking to which I have referred leads to a revolution in means. We're going to find investors making allocations out of their portfolios to impact investment, initially treating it like an asset class. Impact investment in impact venture capital, impact private equity, impact real estate, impact fixed income securities like green bonds, eventually impact public equities, and importantly social and development impact bonds, which really are a new asset class. And as you see the Ford Foundation devote or allocate a billion dollars out of a 12 billion dollar investment to impact investment. As you see, 17 Dutch pension funds get together and say we have to align our portfolios to achievement of the social development goals that Nair and Omri put on, on the, the screen. And as you speak, to investors across the world, you realize that this is going to be very big. 
And as venture capital was, it's going to be a different discipline. Those who are in the investment business today aren't necessarily going to adapt to the new thinking. Optimizing risk, return and impact is a new skill. As Nair put on the screen, it involves intentionality, it involves measurement crucially because if you don't measure, then everybody has impact. Everybody invests with impact, good or bad. But impact investment is impact designed business models that incorporate the achievement of impact and the achievement of profit at the same time. Take Tesla. Would it really have been imaginable that single-handedly an individual sets out to reduce pollution from cars and gets the whole of the automobile industry to move to hybrid and to electric? Isn't it the same as Microsoft coming along with software which people thought would be a tiny speck next to IBM? And Microsoft is worth twice what IBM is worth. Isn't it the same? Look at Mobileye here in Israel. Mobileye started off with the idea of accident prevention. $15 billion exit. And the innovators behind Mobileye set up Orcam. What is Orcam? For those who don't know, most Israelis here know. It's a company which invented spectacles for the visually impaired and for the blind. Spectacles that when you wear them whisper into your ear the name of the street sign in front of you, the value of the banknote in your hand, or the goods on the supermarket shelf. Raised $40 million at a $600 million pre-money valuation. I can rattle off companies that have launched satellites at $300,000 each instead of $30 million to analyze the effects of pesticides on agriculture or crop yield. Um, waste management uh, companies uh, that reduce landfill. I could rattle off a list of 30 or 50 companies across the world today, led by entrepreneurs whose aim is to deliver impact as they deliver profit. The point that was made by Nir, I think, that today we talk about entrepreneurship in the impact area without separating off social sector entrepreneurs and business entrepreneurs is absolutely right. And the illustration of it comes to me because I can see that there are some social issues that are best achieved through business, where you take advantage of growth trends and cash flows and develop a company that grows very fast, and others which are best achieved through not-for-profit models, where the help of the community is required, and if you use a for-profit model, then the community is suspicious of you. Social impact bonds can serve both. Why do I mention social impact bonds? Because they connect with tech for good. You talked about the problems of education. We're working on setting up in India and in Africa and in the Middle East two $1 billion philanthropic outcomes payments fund. Philanthropists and aid organizations, instead of buying inputs, will pay out 
from a professionally managed outcomes payments fund for the achievement of educational objectives. Once you set it up, what happens? $700 million of development impact bond and social impact bond money will flow into funds that are professionally managed, looking for entrepreneurs like you in the room, for-profit or not-for-profit structures, who believe that they can revolutionize the attainment level in education in Africa, the Middle East, and in India. And we create a market for outcomes. We have a purchaser of outcomes, and we have investors in outcomes, and we have impact entrepreneurs achieving outcomes. And we have very powerful tools to do it now. If you look at the Bridge Academy in Kenya, who have had tremendous results in improving educational levels, they're using iPads with African teachers in order to improve the quality of the teaching. Just one small example of how tech for good, in the general sense, not just the organization that's hosting us or organizing this event today, just one example of how you can use technology to achieve good through a not-for-profit model as well as for-profit model. Now, why do I think that Israel can be a leader in this? And why do you see in this audience today people from social finance, from IVN, I think from Dualis, from Bridges Ventures, from New Era, all impact investment organizations? Part of the reason is that the value system in Israel is, as the ambassador said, entrepreneurial and innovative. But part of it is very deep in each and every one of our families. We were all brought up to balance what we do for others with what we do for ourselves. We were brought up with a Jewish concept of tikkun olam. You have a duty to improve the world. And that's why Startup Nation will also become Impact Nation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. That was... Um that was inspiring. As I was standing over there, I was thinking, OK, I, I have probably 45 questions that I want to come and talk to you about after that. Um, <laughs> I wish we had the time. Um, there's one that I'm, I'm going to come back to. I really appreciated the perspective. You started off talking about when you started in this and, and then where it's going. And you talked about the role of millennials. I wonder if you'd just come back to the role of millennials as they shape the next generation. I know we have a lot of millennials in the room today, and you also talked about the disruption in the investment model and how some of the kind of existing players won't perhaps be able to follow on with the new thinking. Could you just spend another moment or two on that? Sure. Thank you very much. So, I don't know uh, that you'll agree with my analysis of why um, millennials are picking up uh, the baton. I guess, uh, the note one, is just the natural reaction that you have when you look at the state of the world. There was a joke many years ago that somebody walked past uh, a wall and on the wall was written from the Bible, the New Testament, the meek shall inherit the earth. And some wisecrack had crossed out that and written below it, yes, they're too meek to refuse. <laughs> okay? So part of it is the sense that the millennial generation has that they're inheriting a world which is going to collapse mm. environmentally and socially, and they just can't continue like that. But the idealism, somebody said to me, 
the idealism of the millennial generation comes in part from people from my generation and the generation after it. The 60s generation was an idealistic generation. And these ended up being the teachers mm. of the millennial generation. Whatever the reason for it, the fact is today that if I look at my own family, at my daughter, who's a, a prophet with purpose, entrepreneur here in Israel, with two fantastic tech partners, creating a fintech platform to help poor families get out of debt, mm. or whether I look at the children of my friends, or whether I look at the stream of young people who come to me for advice, they're all looking for meaning beyond just making money. Yeah. And it's not just in one country, it's everywhere across the world. The Global Steering Group, which I chair, which took over from the G8 task force, expanded the number of countries from 8 to 17, and we're on our way to 30. Fabulous. So we're seeing this coming up everywhere in the world. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Great. Sir Ronald Cohen, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.